Last week, we started to talk about the history of Shotokan Karate. We explored the origin and how founder Gichin Funakoshi combined his training in the Okinawan arts and a reconfigured a system that not only fit the cultural paradigm of Japan, but it also thrived as one of the most influential and definitive styles of karate in the world. So if you haven't watched that one yet, I encourage you to please do so. Today, we're going to talk about the structure of the art itself and how it set a trend of differences between different styles of karate. And we'll also look at how the art has grown and spread and even answer the question of, well, why don't we see Shotokan in the MMA? Spoiler alert, you do. And we'll talk about how as we continue with the history of Shotokan. I would like to thank some of our viewers for their help with this video. A special thanks to William Armenteros, Keith Westmoreland, and Sensei Santino Ramos for helping connect us with footage, and a special thanks to Ryan Mooney from Combat Karate for filming original footage for this series. Alright, alright. I'm sure now we have some several MMA practitioners watching right now that are saying that Shotokan is ineffective and it won't work in a real fight or in the cage. Well, we're gonna come back to this after we cover some aspects because I'm willing to bet it's a little bit more relevant in the cage than it gets credit for. So why is Shotokan such a pillar in the history of karate? Well, mainly because from this point forward, Shotokan became an established foundation for several arts to come and it set many of the standards associated with karate today. Now, I highly recommend watching part one for the origin of Shotokan and how it developed by founder Gichi Funakoshi. Today, we're gonna to take a closer look at the art of the Shotokan itself and what it teaches. Now, upon stepping into the dojo, there is an immediate sense of culture that often comes with Shotokan. Now, Shotokan may have been derived from Okinawan arts, but make no mistake that there is a very important difference between the two cultures. Now, we're going to dive into this a little bit deeper in the next episode, but Okinawan karate traditionally is a little bit looser on formality, focuses more on teaching individuals in smaller classes, has higher stances and focuses more on upper body, does not typically take part in sport, utilizes more weapons, and treats karate as a family heritage. Shotokan and Japanese karate in general, you will find is a traditional system and many rules of etiquette are in place. There is a strong focus on technical detail and uniformity. Respect and discipline are emphasized as well as pride and presentation. Most traditional karate schools will require that a gi is clean, tidy, and intact. And some schools will even require that the uniform be pressed and ironed. Show up to a class looking proud and crisp. Most Shotokan schools will wear traditional white geese, although in modern days, and especially in the United States, you might see a variety of other colors, and the colors honestly will depend on the individual school. And the same goes with the belt ranking system. There are many different associations for Shotokan, each with different requirements. Now, while there are some arts, such as American Kenpo, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and Kyokushin, that have a fairly consistent colored belt chart, Shotokan schools seem to be a little bit more varied in belt order depending on one school or another. Also, most schools will have some sort of a patch worn over the heart on the left side of the gi jacket. In many Shotokan schools, you may see the Toro no Maki, or Tiger Emblem, worn, or some emblem derived from it. Now, this emblem is rooted in the history of the creation of the art, and it represents the philosophy and poetry of Master Funakoshi. Now, we have given karate uniforms, belts, and the Toro no Maki all their own dedicated episodes, and those links are provided in the video description below. Like many martial arts, there is a general code of conduct within the Shotokan Dojo. Bowing is commonplace and demonstrates respect, trust, and humility. You have the standing bow and the bow from the kneeling position, or seiza. Upon entering the dojo, you bow to show respect before entering the floor. Now, whether you are arriving or leaving, you face towards the front of the dojo as you bow. Now, if you arrive late and the class has already started, do not just quickly bow in and run to join the floor. Proper etiquette is to quietly bow and then kneel near the entrance until you are acknowledged by the sensei to come join class. Line up by rank, and when instructed, kneel down into seiza. The proper kneel in the traditional Shotokan Dojo begins by placing your left knee on the floor, followed by your right knee, and then you sit back onto your feet with your toes overlapping one over the other. Hands are placed on your thigh, left on left, right on right, and they are open with fingers pointed inward. Your back should be straight and your shoulders relaxed. 
The sensei may call for meditation, and this is the moment to quiet your mind, leave your distractions outside, and prepare yourself to focus on today's class. Some schools may have you place your left hand into your right hand as you meditate. At the end of meditation, the sensei will prompt you to stop and then call out Shomen Ni Rei, which signals for you to bow in a kneeling position towards the front of the dojo and issue respect and humility towards the institution and those in the lineage of the school. After that, the sensei may call out Sensei Ni Rei, which is another bow to show respect to your teacher. Repeat the motion, and with a signal from your sensei, you quickly get up to your feet and you stand at attention. This is commonplace at many traditional Shotokan schools, but of course, this may vary from one individual dojo to another. Some schools may omit or alter the bowing in sequence. And as with most martial arts styles, respect, good behavior, cooperation, and self-control are expected during class. Once class is over, many schools will close with the same sequence as the class opening. But at this point, meditation is used to reflect on what you learned today and give your mind a moment to let the experience soak in. Upon closing out, many dojos will recite what is called the dojo-kun. The dojo-kun, in literal translation, means rules of the dojo. Now, the dojo-kun is a set of principles and behavior expected from all participating karateka. Most of the time, they are printed or written and hung in front of the dojo. Now, this is yet another traditional practice that is often attributed to Kinshin Funakoshi and his philosophical contribution to the arts. You see, Funakoshi desired ethics and mental fortitude to be balanced with physical strength. Shotokan Karate wasn't only about being strong and fighting, but rather it was to serve as a way of life, to have balance in body, mind, and spirit, and to use the art for cultivation of health, and if in a dangerous situation, the preservation of life. The Dojo-kun was written as a set of five guiding principles to be practiced in Shotokan Karate. One, seek perfection of character. Two, be faithful. Three, endeavor to excel. Four, respect others. And five, refrain from violent behavior. Now, of course, you might see some variations of this due to translation, but those generally are the five principles of conduct as defined by Funakoshi. Now, being the philosopher and poet that he was, Funakoshi also established the Nijukun, or 20 rules. Now, we're going to revisit a couple of these at the end of this video, but the 20 Shotokan principles are Never forget, karate begins and ends with Rei, or bowing and showing respect. There is no first strike in karate. Karate stands on the side of justice. First, understand yourself, then understand others. Mentality over technique. The heart must be set free. Calamity springs from carelessness. Karate goes beyond the dojo. Karate is a lifelong pursuit. Apply the way of karate to all things, therein lies the beauty. Karate is like boiling water. Without heat, it returns to its tepid state. Do not think of winning, think rather of not losing. Make adjustments according to your opponent. The outcome of battle depends on how one handles emptiness and fullness. Think of hands and feet as swords. When you step beyond your own gate, you face a million enemies. Formal stances are for beginners. Later, one stands more naturally. Perform prescribed sets of techniques exactly. Actual combat is another matter. Do not forget the employment or withdrawal of power, the extension or contraction of the body, the swift or leisurely application of technique. Be constantly mindful, diligent, and resourceful in your pursuit of the way. Like many traditional karate styles, Shotokan is broken up into three main categories. Kihon, Kata, and Kumite. Now, Kihon is the Japanese word for basics. These are the fundamental concepts of the martial arts. So all punches, kicks, blocks, steps, throws, posture, movements are all part of basic training. Without strong basics, the rest of the student's training becomes compromised. See, Shotokan is very well known for its power and embodiment of strong basics. From the deeply rooted stances to snapping punches and dominant kicks, Shotokan is as sharp and crisp as karate pretty much gets. Much of this comes from the Okinawan roots that Funakoshi adopted from Shurite and Nahate prior to coming to Japan. Its signature is commanding linear driving power. Shotokan also employs the kiai and the concept of kimei to underline the basics. Kimei is a Japanese word that means to decide, and in the context of the martial arts, it means to focus all of one's energy, effort, and strength into each technique. It is full commitment to the strike without any hesitation, with the intent of ending the confrontation with a single blow. This can be applied to punches, kicks, and even blocks, which in many cases can be used as strikes in their own right. 
The ki is the famous karate yell we all hear practitioners exclaim upon the execution of a powerful technique. The purpose of the ki isn't just to sound badass, although if done right, it totally does, but it serves a few different functions. First, in the context of the dojo setting, a powerful ki can set the tone of a workout, excite students, and get them more invested highlight the punctuation of a technique, and also to help learn proper breathing to deliver maximum intensity into a strike. You can inadvertently hold back a lot of power if you hold your breath, so learning how to ki properly helps you establish effective times to exhale and tighten in order to inflict a margin of extra energy. Now, in a real-life confrontation, the ki still serves for power generation, but it also might potentially intimidate your opponent, or at least possibly attract attention to the situation. Kata is short for the word katachi, which means shape, form, or pattern. In Shotokan, and quite frankly in most traditional martial arts, katas are longer sequences of techniques, often simulating the combat scenario and demonstrating how movements, strikes, and defenses can be used together. Katas help with memory retention and repetition, as well as address themes in particular areas of focus. Now, many contemporary martial artists dislike and will brush off kata, which is fine because honestly, people have different areas of focus. Now, with that being said, there is often a lot of valuable information embedded in kata and the practice of studying deeper meaning of kata or bunkai can yield some interesting insights and philosophy to the art and relationships between techniques. The number of kata and shotokan training will vary from school to school as they construct their own curriculum. However, there are usually about 26 or 27 kata in the system created by both Funakoshi and his contributing students. Many of these kata were adopted from the Okinawan arts Funakoshi trained in heavily drawing from the influence of former teacher and karate master, Anko Otosu, and his contributions to the development of kata. See, many of the kata bore Chinese names, and as Okinawa, you know, shared strong roots entwined with the Chinese arts. There was a political tension between China and Japan at the time, so just as he changed the characters of the Japanese kanji for karate to mean empty hand instead of China or tang hand, Funakoshi renamed all of the katas for his system into Japanese counterparts. Now, some of them caught on, while many of them still retain their original names. For example, the Pinan katas, which Pinan means peaceful way, were five original empty hand katas from Okinawa. Funakoshi renamed them to Heian, which also means peaceful way. Now later, as the Korean art of Tang Soo Do was founded on the base of Shotokan, those katas, or pumse in Korean, were adopted and modified for the Tang Soo Do system and are known as Pyongan. So it's really interesting to see Shotokan in the middle of the chain of influence as it spread around the world. Another interesting example is the Kanku Kata, originally known as Kusanku, named after a traveling Chinese martial artist whose teachings predate the early roots of karate in Okinawa. Now there are two versions of this kata, which Funakoshi renamed to Kanku, which means to look at the sky. So you've got Kanku Dai, big, and Kanku Sho, small. This kata spans across many arts, including Okinawan Shonru, Shotokan, Kyokushin, Tang Soo Do, and more. It is very interesting to find videos of these katas performed in these different arts and notice the similarities as they were adapted to new practices. Now, as we mentioned on how important the ki was when practicing basics, it holds a place in Shotokan kata as well. In most kata and shotokan, there are two designated times which the practitioners unleash their ki. It is part of the form and part of the grading and judging. It is to punctuate certain moments in the kata, as well as to demonstrate commitment and full force into the form. So go ahead and watch some shotokan katas on YouTube and watch the practitioners and you'll find that there are usually only two ki during the entire sequence. Now as Funakoshi's influence continues, it is also rolled into the concept of embusin, or the route or line of movement a practitioner takes during the performance of a kata. Every kata has a unique flow, and therefore their own signature diagram if you were to draw it out. It designates a starting point and outlines the path of action. Now, Funakoshi's contribution to this practice was to adjust many katas so that the starting point and the ending point are roughly the same spot. Now, this has one benefit of being able to be performed in smaller spaces, in case there are many students in one room. As well, it is also helpful for the students to confirm that they have performed it correctly if they have ended up in the same place that they started. Now, many people believe that this aspect of the kata was traditional. However, it is credited to Funakoshi as it was documented in his writings and not before. And it's often not present in a lot of the earlier Okinawan arts. The concept of starting and ending at the same points have found its way into other arts, American Kempo included. So, traditional karate systems have three components, kihon, kata, and kumite. Kumite means freestyle fighting, and it is where you apply the tools of the basics along with the principles of the kata into a strategy of fighting that works for you. 
Now, beginners will start off with what is called Ippon Kumite, which means one step sparring, and Gohan Kumite, which is five step sparring. Now, this is where a lot of criticism of Shotokan and traditional martial arts in general may stem from. See, one step sparring is very simple and each drill typically consists of one partner performing a single pre-planned attack and the defending partner performs a single step defense, such as a block followed by a counter strike. With five step sparring, some of the attacks and moves are repeated, but overall these are very choreographed and basic drills. Now the misconception here is that many critics of traditional martial arts look at this and will dismiss the system saying, well that isn't realistic and these drills won't work in a real fight. I think it is really important to remember or note that this is not the complete self-defense portion of karate. These one and five step drills are meant to teach the very basic application of a single technique, demonstrating control, targeting, and getting used to working with a partner. It doesn't end with this. As students progress and become more comfortable and understand how the basics work, the drill evolves into more free attacks of one step sparring and eventually into more advanced freestyle fighting, which may involve many varieties of speed and allowed strikes. Now, as far as actual fighting skill goes, we've said this on the channel before, but I wanna stress it again, that regardless of what drills you practice or how many times you repeat a choreographed motion, unless you apply it on a regular basis with a resisting opponent, you're not going to get an accurate idea of what actually works for you or what doesn't. This means regular continuous sparring with someone trying their hardest to hit you back. Now some schools practice point sparring as well, and that is completely fine, especially if the school is a competitive school and point sparring definitely has its benefits, but I believe for proper self-defense, you need to practice with the resistance and pressure as close to a real fight as can be safely done in the classroom. And with that being said, yes, the one step drills can work in the heat of a good sparring session. There have been many occasions that I've been trading shots with someone and I've seen the punch coming and the upper block punch combination worked brilliant or the inner block punch and I've had it done to me as well. So yes, they absolutely can work if they are applied at the right time. If you understand what it is teaching and you're able to apply it effectively in a full pressure sparring situation, then the basic drills taught in Shotokan can go a long way. So let's rewind a little bit here to our question in the beginning. Why don't we see Shotokan in the MMA? Well, we do and we see it in a couple different ways. First, there seems to be this divide between mixed martial arts and traditional martial arts. I don't like this debate primarily because mixed martial arts can be an independent mix of traditional martial arts. MMA is not a different system or way of fighting. It's just a personalized combination of arts primed for a sport competition by individual competitors that choose mixes that work for them. I think MMA is fantastic and it has the world's best fighters, but not because of what systems they use, but rather how the they choose the arts that they choose and the extreme training and condition they apply in order to fight like this. MMA and traditional martial arts are not two separate entities. They are entwined and they simply address different things and I always try to bridge that gap. And with that being said, many mixed martial artists have some sort of traditional karate as part of their arsenal. And as we've explored in this series, the threads of Shotokan run through many of them. I want to use Lyoto Machida as an example, primarily because he is a high profile MMA champion, as well as one of his primary arts being Shotokan Karate. Now watching him in the stand up fighting, you can clearly see many trademarks of Shotokan and traditional Karate. First, he often takes on a little bit of a wider stance. Many MMA fighters have a more natural boxing stance, and while Machida does as well, he will sometimes drop into a lower stance, very stylistic of Shotokan. And it's from there that he delivers the devastating kicks he is known for. His front kicks and his round kicks are perfect illustrations of the power Shotokan strikes can have. And if you watch some of his fights, you see many of his opponents taking those kicks to the body and just reeling from the impact. And going back to those one step drills, if you watch closely, and there are several videos on YouTube that highlight this, but Machida does employ some of those traditional drills in addition to some basic Shotokan striking combinations. For example, an advancing triple punch combination is a very common Karate Kumite basic drill. Yoda Machida employs this frequently and very effectively, along with another combination of a rear leg kick advancing followed by a front hand punch. Basic steps in Kumite drills, but as you can see, Machida mixes them into his fights with great success. Another example is the calf kick intended to take the opponent off balance and combined with a reverse punch, either preceding or following the kick. Just keep watching fights closely and you'll see takedowns and other combinations play out in very similar fashion as to what you learn in the basic one step Kumite drill. The key is in learning how to perfect the technique, knowing when to apply it in freestyle, and then conditioning yourself with a resistant opponent to fine tune it and make it work. But some of you might be thinking, well, that's all well and good, but Lyoto Machida may just be one lone example. Well, not really. Remember, Shotokan is the foundation to a lot of arts that came after it. Many high profile MMA fighters have traditional arts as part of their striking regimen. For example, George St. Pierre is a third degree black belt in Kyokushin. 
Kyokushin has Shotokan and Goju Ryu at its core. Anderson Silva has a very diverse mix of martial arts, including Wing Chun, BJJ, Muay Thai, Capoeira, and Taekwondo. Taekwondo is derived from Tongsudo, which is heavily derived from Shotokan. Chuck the Dell is an 8th Don in Kajukenbo, which has traditional karate and Shotokan mixed in it, and Boss Rutin holds a flak belt in Taekwondo and the Kyokushin. And that's just the high profile guys. If you take a look at some of the lower weight divisions and lower profile fights, you'll see a ton of fighters employing traditional karate into their arsenal. So if you are asking the question, why don't I see Shotokan MMA? The answer is simply, you aren't looking for it. I also encourage you to go back and revisit the Nijukun list and see where you can find some relevance to those 20 principles into your training. Several of them definitely hold true in MMA. For example, calamity springs for carelessness. If you are reckless and unfocused in the cage, you're gonna have a bad time. Make adjustments according to your opponent. Formal stances are for beginners. Later, one stands more naturally. Preform prescribed sets of techniques exactly. Actual combat is another matter. You see, these all hold very true for competitive fighting. And I think my favorite one is, karate is like boiling water. Without heat, it returns to its tepid state. Such a powerful and accurate statement, and it applies to all martial arts. If you stop putting passion and effort into your training, and you forget that you're always a student, it's very easy to get comfortable and complacent, and then your skill set might not have enough steam to be effective when you need it. That is just one of many important lessons that Shotokan teaches us. So if you are interested in getting an introduction to Shotokan before committing to any classes, I do recommend this book. It's the Shotokan Bible by Ashley P. Martin. It's a really good book that breaks down the basic curriculum from white belt all the way up to black belt. And while it's not gonna replace a live class, it gives you a great idea of what to expect and encounter in a Shotokan class. So thank you so much for watching. Please join us on Patreon so that we can continue to make videos like this. And be sure to subscribe and click on the bell notification so you get an alert when the History of Shotokan Part 3 drops next week. And also one of the benefits to being a Patreon member is once in a while we will release an episode early, which our current members already know because they've already seen this one first.